Thanks very much, and uh, thank you to you all for not scheduling your flights out too early. Um, my name is Ian Fellows. Uh, I'm the CEO of Fellow Statistics. We're a small boutique data science and statistics consultancy in San Diego. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about a, uh, uh, a package that I developed um, called IPC that uh, was really, um, you know, out of some, uh, born out of some, some problems and frustrations we were having uh, dealing with shiny apps when there are long-running processes um, involved or, or computationally intensive. Now, this is R, right? This is a statistical computing language. So we shouldn't be too surprised when things take uh, you know, a significant amount of time doing bootstraps, Markov chain, Monte Carlo, uh, or various complicated analytic techniques. Um, and there are some design considerations that you need to think about when you're dealing with long-running, computationally intensive tasks. Um, and you want to make those available to a wider audience through a, through a shiny application. Uh, the first and arguably most important thing is don't block everything, right? So if one user is doing something computationally complex, uh, it shouldn't block the entire server from being able to do um, any computation so that another user's user interface all of a sudden locks up uh, and they have no idea why. Um, the second is that uh, a single user, so if you've got multiple things going on in your application and one of them is a computationally complex task, well, all of the other interface elements and outputs uh, should not be blocked um, and hang while the code is executing. That leads to a poor user experience. Um, and third, the user needs to have insight into that computation. You know, if a user doesn't know whether a computation is going to take 10 seconds or 10 hours, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly frustrating. And because all of the speakers are contractually obligated to put a meme up, um, you know, the, this, is, this is kind of how you feel. It's like, it's very uncomfortable. Uh, my favorite movie, Hocus Pocus. Um, it's very uncomfortable, and, you know, it's, 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 it's not something uh, that's great for your design. Okay, so uh, let's say that you've got a long-running task. This is sort of the hello world of long-running tasks. Uh, you've got, your, um, you've got your, your, your text input, which is who are we going to say hello to, hello to today, um, an action button that when we click it will uh, we'll run the thing, and then in the text output we're going to put um, hello to, we're going to say hello to whoever, whoever we want. All right, so we've got a reactive value, and that value is being rendered uh, into the result. And then when we hit run, we got a nice little progress bar here, uh, which is going to close. And then we're doing our long running task down here. Uh, we're updating our progress bar. And in the end, we put our salutation, um, salutation in there, right? So uh, very simple, and it's, and it's sort of like how you would go about it um, at, you know, just uh, going ahead and like naively writing your, your code. Um, so go ahead and run this. Um, hello world. Uh, you know, I don't care. I don't care about the world. I only care about you guys. So, uh, so we want to say hello to you guys. So we've got a nice little uh, uh, progress bar here. I understand how long it's going to take. Um, of course, uh, there, are some, there are some major issues with, uh, with doing the, this sort of naive way. Um, and uh, and and the good thing is the user's shown progress. I get insight into the computation. The bad thing is the entire the entire server is blocked. Um, nobody can do anything else while that uh, while while we're figuring out how to say hello to to to, to whoever we want to say hello to. Um, and no other output values in the user interface. If there were multiple output things, would be. Um, updated while this computation is running. Also, not on here, the user can't cancel that operation. If they decide, oh, these parameters, I don't want to do 100,000 bootstraps because that's going to take 10 years. I want to lower it to, to 100. There's no way to, to cancel that operation. The solution, um, which uh, Joe presented at, at the uh, last R Studio conference, uh, is to utilize uh, asynchronous um, computation, to kick that long-running task out to a separate process and then return the values back. Uh, so here's an implementation of Hello World with async. 
Um, basically, everything's the same except for now we're kicking out using the future package. Our long running computation is happening outside. And then uh, we get the result of that computation, and then it kicks back to our local and assigns that to our reactive value. Um, OK, so this is good. You'll notice that we assign to a temporary value here um, the value of our input. And we have to do that because the, the pro process that you kick off as a child can have no, com uh, no uh, uh, interaction. It doesn't have access to the reactive context. It's an entirely separate process, and these two can't talk to each other. Um, and so you need to uh, uh, assign that to a temporary value, which is then shipped off to that, to that process um, to, for, for utilization. OK, so then we can go ahead and uh, just run that. So with async. So let's actually kill it. So with async, now we hit run. Oh, god, how long is this going to take? I don't know, because uh, we don't have a progress bar anymore. And the reason why we don't have a progress bar is because we don't have access to our reactive context. There's no communication that can happen. Um, and so we finally get our hello world back, but we've had to drop uh, that progress bar. Okay, so the good thing is uh, the server's not blocked. Um, and actually, the way that we coded it up, output values can be updated while that computation is running. The bad is we've lost all visibility into the computation. It doesn't know about the server. The server doesn't know about it. The only time they can interact is after the computation is done. So that's where the IPC package comes along. IPC is a package that's devoted to, um, it's devoted to uh, providing mechanism for, for, to communicate back and forth uh, between uh, processes and to ship uh, uh, computations and expressions between these compu uh, uh, threads um, for, for execution. Now, um, here's just a simple, a simple code. Here we create a queue. Now, these messaging queues can be backed by some sort of external database that both of the processes have access to. By default, that is uh, done via, um, via temporary files using the uh, uh, the TXT queue package, but other backings are available. For instance, Redis is also, um, is also an implemented option. Now, each queue has uh, a consumer that contains methods for, for processing things from the queue and a producer to fire off messages to the queue. So here we have a future. We're going to create a future. It's going to just basically run forever, uh, periodically uh, 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 having the consumer run consume, and then uh, in our main thread, we're going to tell the producer to fire off a message to evaluate the expression stop, stop that child uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the future. So when that consume is called after and it reads the message, it will process it and execute the expression stop, stop that child. Um, and then uh, the future will uh, throw an error and the future will stop. OK, so important methods. Uh, on the consumer side, you've got consume. This will process all of the messages on the queues, and uh, it will evaluate it, uh, those, those messages in the environment which you provide it. Uh, by default, that's the environment in which it was called. Uh, start is similar, except it just runs consume every uh, periodically uh, uh, as, long as, the, um, as long as R is idle. Also. Uh, we have the, uh, uh, the queue comes shipped with, a, with, with the ability to uh, handle a couple of different types of messages, uh, but you can also add your own uh, custom handlers to handle particular signals and messages that you want to send. On the producer side, uh, you fire off signals using the fired method. Uh, and there's a couple of special uh, ones that are, are useful. Uh, you can fire eval, we'll, we'll signal for, to evaluate an expression. Fire call, we'll signal um, to evaluate a, or to call a function with arguments dot, dot, dot. Or fire do call, we'll fire the function called name uh, with parameters list param. So basically, 
Um, you can have your own custom handlers, but you can do almost, because evaluation and, and calls are so flexible, you can basically do any sort of computational message that you want to send via uh, fire, call, fire eval or fire call. Okay, so here's, here's an example. Before we saw sending a message from, from the parent to uh, the future, here we're going to send from the future to the child. So we create a queue, um, and then in the future, we're going to fire an eval, which is going to print index. Um, and then what we're going to do is uh, over here, so when you fire eval, uh, it will substitute the values in the second argument into the expression. So we're going to substitute i in for index here. And so uh, i is going from 1 to 100. So this will basically count from 1 to 100. Um, and it will say, hey, go print this out. And here in the... Um, uh, in the um, uh, parent thread. Uh, and so that's pretty easy. Um, so you can just run that. And so basically, while R is idle in the, uh, uh, in the thread, it will just keep on printing out these numbers till it gets to, it gets to 100. And that's all coming from the other process. Okay, so we talked, fi finally we're getting back to Shiny. Um, we've got some special stuff in, sh in, in this package specifically for Shiny because that's really the major use case that we're trying to target. Uh, Shiny Q creates a queue with a few extras specifically for Shiny applications. It also does cleanup um, of the queue and temporary files and everything uh, you know, on session end so you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Um, it's also got a couple of methods, fire notify and fire assign reactive for creating notifications or assigning uh, values to reactive uh, values um, specifically. And also we've got uh, two really important classes. Uh, async progress is a drop-in replacement for, uh, for Shiny's progress class uh, that will allow you to do progress bars um, in your, uh, your long-running task. Async interrupter is another one that's important. For send, it's a class for sending interrupt signals. Um, so you just call the interrupt method in, let's say, your, your Shiny application. And then periodically within the future, you call exec interrupts. And uh, it will check that for any interrupts that have been signaled and will uh, throw an error. OK, so we can take a look at two of those in practice uh, in our example application. So here's a very similar application. So we just got a run and a cancel button and some output. Um, so here we're creating a new interrupter. And then when we hit the run button, we're going to create a new progress bar. And now we've kicked off into our um, future. And the progress, we're going to increment the progress within our future. And we're going to check for any interrupts. And we'll throw an error if we, if we hit one. Um, and then over here, uh, if the cancel button's hit, then uh, we uh, signal an interrupt. And so, yeah, we can see this working. So we're doing a complex analysis. Hey, this is great. Um, I understand how long this is going to take. I get out um, a very insightful result, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, this is cancelable. So I can use or interrupt it. Um, and basically, this gives, gives you the ability to have you know, a bunch of different parameters. The user can try it. They can say, oh, no, I should have done 1,000 bootstraps, not 10,000. I can, I can customize it so that it will take a reasonable amount of time according to my own definition. How much time do I have left? Five and a half minutes. So I can show you an, another one um, that's, that's kind of fun. So uh, we're all familiar with the old faithful um, uh, geyser example that, uh, that, that, that Shiny has. Uh, and it's just, an, it's just a, it's a simple application that allows you to create a histogram and change the, uh, the number of bins. Now what I've added to this is a little bit of kaleidoscope action. Um, so when, uh, when we change it, we're going to kick off a future 
Well, first of all, we uh, create a new shiny queue and we start execution of the consumer. And we have a color variable that we're going to change in that future. And um, here, we're going to cycle through the rainbow. And so uh, uh, every, every second, we're going to change the color of our, uh, of our histogram to a, to a different color. Um, and this is going to happen regardless of us changing around um, our, uh, uh, the actual um, slider value. OK, so if you don't remember what it looks like, it looks like this. It's a nice little thing. So we're cycling through. Um, that's fine. But while we're cycling through, while we're doing something, we can change this, uh, this slider here, and it will keep cycling through. So I know this is, this is a bit of a toy, but it shows you that you can start to make your Shiny apps do multiple things at the same time and have multiple different uh, interactive components that are all uh, dynamically occurring together. Um, and that's what the power of, of, of that sort of communication framework, the ability to ship executions between the different uh, processes that you have running uh, allows you to do. Uh, so that is all I have. I'm interested in any questions. Um, I had a question about the, like the producer and consumers. Is it like bi-directional? Is they both are producers and consumers, or does, it, does communication flow in one direction? Um, yeah, so anyone could call it, so you could, the object, the queue object can, is sort of like a wrapper, it contains both a, a consumer and a producer object. Uh, so you can call any of the consumers, you can call any of the producer, um, uh, producer uh, methods. Have, have you seen how this scales by the number of users and what's the overhead on uh, calling the, uh reading the queuing function? So uh, the overhead is writing and reading the message to file. Um, so you know, that's pretty, pretty quick. Uh, there was a little bit of an overhead, but we, we, we fixed that um, issue when there were very large messages. But especially if you're doing smaller messages, the overhead is, is very minimal. Um, and you can also change the backing to a different, uh, faster uh, connection if you wanted to. Uh, 